Hello, first graders. As you can tell, I'm not in our classroom. I'm in my house. But today I thought that I would read you some of the panda puzzle. I know you've been waiting for it. Let's start chapter one. Here's the picture. Looks like they're at some sort of zoo. Chapter one. I can't believe Greenlawn has its own pandas, Rufo said. She held up her dad's camcorder. I hope I can get them on videotape. Ruth Rose always dressed in one color. Today she wore sky blue from head to toe. Ruth Rose, her little brother Nate, and her friends, Dink and Josh, were visiting the petting zoo. A mother panda and her baby had just arrived the day before. All four kids stood in the middle of the crowd near a panda enclosure. Dink recognized a lot of his friends from school. He waved at Officer Fallon and his grandson, Jimmy. Through the skinny rails of the enclosure fence, the kids could see a cave and a pool of water. Bamboo grew beside the cave. From his pocket, Dink pulled out a folded paper. It was an issue of the panda paper. The front page story was all about how the pandas, Ping and Winnie, had come to Greenlawn. The headline was, Petting Zoo, Perfect Place for Pandas. I'm going to ask the editor if I can write a story about the baby panda, Dink said. Josh was chomping on an apple and holding Pal's leash. If you do, I'll draw its picture for you, he said. Can I play with the panda? asked Nate. Sorry, Nady, Ruth Rose said. Pandas only like to play with other pandas. Nate was on tiptoes. I can't see, he complained. There's too many big people. There's a bench over there, Dink said. We can see better if we stand on it. The four kids climbed onto a nearby bench. Now they could see over the crowd. Pal flopped on the lawn with a big sigh and closed his eyes. The crowd stood just outside the fence. Off to one side, standing near a microphone, were two men and a woman. The kids recognized the woman. Her name was Irene Naper and she worked at the petting zoo. She fed the animals and made sure they were safe and comfortable. She was wearing a green uniform with the words petting zoo stitched onto her pocket. Next to Irene was a short man with spiky yellow hair. That was Tom Steele, the editor of the Panda Paper. Who's the guy wearing the necktie, Josh asked. The man Josh had asked was very, about was very tan. He was whispering something to Irene Naper. That's Flip Francis, Dink said. He showed Josh a picture in the Panda Paper. His grandmother gave the money to Greenlawn to build this park. Just then, Flip Francis spoke into the microphone. Can you all hear me? He asked. Ruth Rose turned on the camcorder and aimed it toward the microphone. Hi, everyone. I'm Flip Francis, he said. As many of you know, it was my grandmother, Winifred Francis, who made Panda Park possible. Granny Wynn would be happy that you all came to meet little Winnie, and I'm pleased that her money went to such a good cause. He turned to Irene Naper. Irene is taking good care of our new arrivals, he said, handing her the microphone. Thanks, Flip, Irene said into the mic. I just want to say that I've loved getting to know little Winnie. She's a happy, playful baby. Irene passed the mic to Tom Steele. Hello, everyone, the editor said. As you know, the Panda Paper has a very small staff. Me. I could use some help. I'd love to print your stories, poems, or pictures about pandas. Tom Steele grinned. But I can't pay you anything. Everyone in the crowd laughed. Just then, a black and white face appeared inside the cave's entrance. The crowd quieted. Slowly, the mother panda moved into the sunlight. Her head swiveled around as she lifted her nose into the air. Suddenly, she charged the fence and threw her body against the metal rails. Tom Steele, Irene Naper, and Flip Francis leaped back. People at the front of the crowd jumped back, too. What's wrong with her? Ruth Rose asked, catching it all on videotape. Ping stared through the bars of the fence. After a minute, she waddled back into her cave. The panda's acting strange. So this is the mother panda, and her name is Ping. A man in a green uniform hurried over to Irene Naper. Irene handed him her keys, and the man unlocked the fence gate. Carefully, he crossed over to the cave, knelt down, and looked inside. Then he reached in and pulled something out. To Dink, it looked like a round alarm clock. A small piece of paper was tied around it with a string. The man relocked the gate and handed the object to Irene. She removed the paper and silently read what was written on it. This is so weird, Josh whispered. What's going on? Irene stepped back to the microphone. Dink noticed her hand was shaking. This is a ransom note, Irene told the crowd. Winnie has been kidnapped. Oh no, the baby's gone. We only read the first chapter and there was already a crime. And the chapter picture is the panda paper. And the corner picture is a puzzle piece with a little panda on it. Let's read chapter two. Chapter two. Kidnapped, Ruth Rose gasped. Everyone in the crowd began talking at once. Officer Fallon ran to talk to Irene. Where's Winnie? Nate asked. I want to see Winnie. 
Winnie has gone away for a little while, Ruth Rose told her little brother. Where? he insisted. Ruth Rose put her arm around Nate's shoulders. We don't know yet, she said. Officer Fallon stepped up to the microphone. Folks, you might as well go home, he said. We have every reason to believe that Winnie is safe. We'll do our best to get her back. Tom Steele, Flip Francis, and Irene Naper left Panda Park together. Officer Fallon and Jimmy began walking around the outside of the panda enclosure. The crowd slowly wandered away. What a lousy thing to do, Josh said, helping Nate down from the bench. What's going to happen to Winnie, Ruth Rose asked. Doesn't she need her mother to feed her? Dink glanced at a story in the panda paper. It says Winnie's almost six months old, he said. She's eating by herself now. Come on, said Ruth Rose. Let's go talk to Officer Fallon. The kids caught up with the police chief and his grandson outside the fence behind the bamboo forest. Pal flopped on his belly and stuck his nose through the fence rails. Nate sat next to him and patted the dog's head. Hey, kids, Officer Fallon said. Some situation, eh? The kidnappers want a million bucks for Winnie, Jimmy blurted out. Jimmy, his grandfather said. Is it true? Ruth Rose asked. Officer Fallon nodded. I'm afraid that's what this says, he said. Holding the note by its edges, he let the kids inspect it. Josh read the note aloud. Leave one million dollars in the hollow tree on Goose Island by midnight. No tricks or you'll never see Winnie again. A million dollars, Ruth Rose cried. Where would Greenlawn get all that money? As I recall, Officer Fallon said, there's still over a million left from the money Winifred Francis left. The kidnapper must know that. Dink examined the note. What does the kidnapper mean by tricks, he asked. He means we shouldn't put any police officers on the island to catch him when he comes for the money, Officer Fallon said, or tamper with the bills so we can trace them. Ruth Rose studied the ransom note. These letters were cut out of a newspaper, she said. Yes, Officer Fallon said, which means we can't trace the note. Suddenly, Pal let out a woof. He struck a paw through the fence and began scratching. Josh bent down to see what Pal was doing. Guys, look, he said. Partly hidden among the bamboo stalks was something shiny. It's a knife, Jimmy said. Officer Fallon got down on his knees. It sure is, he said. He scratched Pal behind the ears. Good dog. Officer Fallon struck a long arm through the fence and picked up the knife. He brought it out, being careful on not to cut himself. The knife had a thin blade and a big handle made of cork. Looks like a fishing knife, Officer Fallon said. If the knife gets dropped in the water, the handle will float. There's a picture of a fishing knife. That's strange. Can I have it, Grandpa? Jimmy asked. Afraid not, Jimmy, Officer Fallon said. This is evidence. He drew a clean handkerchief from his pocket and carefully wrapped the knife. Hey, look at this, Josh said. He reached through the fence and pulled back a stalk of bamboo. The top had been sliced neatly off. There's more, Josh said, pointing through the fence. Someone cut a bunch of the stuff. Maybe the kidnapper took some bamboo to feed Winnie, Ruth Rose said. At least she won't be hungry, Josh said. That explains the knife, Officer Fallon said. With a struggling panda in his arms, the kidnapper probably never knew he dropped it. Officer Fallon reached into his pocket. He pulled out the object that had been found in Ping's cave. Know what this is? He asked. It looks like an alarm clock, Dink said. It is, Officer Fallon said. It's an alarm clock with the volume set on loud. I'm guessing the kidnapper tossed it into Ping's cave, knowing the panda would run out when the thing went off. He probably grabbed Winnie as she came out of the cave. And if we want to get her back, Ding said, Greenlawn has to pay a million dollars. You're right, Officer Fallon said, unless we find the bad guy first. But we only have till midnight, Ruth Rose said. She looked at her watch. That's only 12 hours from now. So they only have 12 hours to find the panda napper. It's not very much time. I keep thinking about how in that other book they said nothing bad ever happens in Greenlawn. And Noah was like, what? Stop. Bad things always happen in Greenlawn. Now we have panda nappers in Greenlawn. This doesn't seem like a safe town. Let's read chapter three. I'm hungry, Nate announced. Can we go home? Okay, said Ruth Rose. I'll make us some sandwiches. And I've got to get to my office and check these for fingerprints, Officer Fallon said. But unless this guy was not very smart, he'd have worn gloves. They separated at the police station. Dink, Josh, Ruth Rose, and Nate headed for Woody Street. At Ruth Rose's house, the kids made lunch. Nate took a sandwich to the living room to watch a dinosaur video. Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose ate theirs at the kitchen table. Pal snoozed at Josh's feet. It's almost one o'clock, Dink said, 11 hours till midnight. So where do we start looking for a panda napper, asked Josh. It could be anyone, Dink said. Ruth Rose chewed slowly. Not anyone, she said after a minute. If that knife really was the kidnapper's, maybe the person's a fisherman. Ruth Rose nodded. Whoever it was either has a key to the gate or can climb over tall fences, Josh went on. He reached for another sandwich. So who does that narrow it down to? Anyone, Ruth Rose said glumly. Nate screeched from the living room. Dinosaur fight! Come see, you guys! 
Josh ran to the living room with Dink and Ruth Rose following. On the TV screen, a Tyrannosaurus and a Stegosaurus were cir circling each other. Their tails lashed back and forth. The Tyrannosaurus roared and snapped his enormous teeth. Then the dinosaurs were gone and the scene switched to a museum. A man's face appeared on the screen. Hello, I'm Dr. Paleo, he said, and I'd like to talk to you about what you just saw in this video. An idea popped into Dink's head. Ruth Rose, didn't you tape what happened at Panda Park this morning? Why don't we watch your video? Maybe we'll see some clues. Good idea, Ruth Rose said. Do you mind, Nady? Can I have a cookie? Nate asked, grinning at his sister. Sure, bring the box in here so we can all have some, okay? Okay, Nate said, racing toward the kitchen. Ruth Rose ejected the dinosaur video, then plugged the camcorder into the VCR. Nate came back with the cookie box. Josh reached for one as Ruth Rose hit the play button. The kids watched as Tom Steele, Irene Naper, and Flip Francis came on the screen. Seconds later, Ping emerged from her cave. Ping looked around, froze, then turned her head sharply. Suddenly, she rushed forward and began throwing herself at the fence. She sure looks angry, Dink said. You'd be mad too if someone stole your baby, Josh said. It looks like she's trying to attack someone outside the fence. Someone in the crowd? Ruth Rose asked. She's not looking at the crowd, Dink said. He put his finger on the TV screen. Remember, the microphone was there, off to the side. That's where she's looking. She's mad at the microphone? Josh asked, grabbing two more cookies. Dink's right, Ruth Rose said. Ping is looking at the people standing at the microphone. Dink, Josh, and Ruth Rose stared at the TV screen. Josh is eating cookies. What else is new? But it seems like Ping is looking right at the people standing at the microphone. So maybe we should think about who was standing there. Um, finally, Ruth Rose unplugged the camcorder and put Nate's dinosaur tape back into the VCR. I think one of those three people kidnapped Winnie, she said, and Ping knows which one. That's the end of the chapter. So at the microphone, there was Flip Francis, whose grandmother donated the money to Panda Park. There was Irene Naper, who is in charge of Panda Park and takes care of the pandas. And then the third one was Tom Steele, who um, runs the panda paper. So it seems like in this one, we have three main suspects. Hmm. Chapter four. You think Winnie's kidnapper was standing right there at the microphone? Dink asked. Ruth Rose nodded. Yes, and I think Ping recognized him or her. That's why she charged the fence. But the guy probably stole Winnie at night, Dink said. So how could Ping, Ping have seen him? Maybe she didn't see him, Ruth Rose said, but she might have smelled him. Right, Josh said. Most animals can smell a lot better than humans. Dink stared at the TV screen. So how do we figure out who Ping was growling at, he asked. Too bad pandas can't talk, Josh said. We could just ask her. Pandas can't talk, Ruth Rose said, but people can. I say we interview the three people who were standing at the microphone, starting with Irene Naper. You think she did it? Dink asked. I don't know, Ruth Rose said, but she does have a key to the gate. If she thinks we suspect her, she might clam up, Josh said. Ruth Rose pointed at Dink's notebook. We'll tell her we're writing a story for the panda paper. Good idea, Dink said. Josh stood up and patted his stomach. I have to be home by four to watch the twins for an hour, he said. Ruth Rose grabbed the cookie box. It was empty. Joshua, I didn't get a single cookie, she said. Josh grinned. Detective work makes me hungry. Everything makes him hungry. Josh woke up Pal and the kids left Ruth Rose's house. They took a shortcut through the Rose Garden in Center Park. Pal barked at the swan being trailed by three cygnets. They passed the book nook and waved at Mr. Paskey in the window. At the petting zoo, they passed under a wooden arch. A honeysuckle vine climbed the arch, filling the air with a sweet smell. A hummingbird darted away. That sounds like a nice place to be. They found Irene Naper surrounded by ducks. She was feeding them pellets that she pulled from one of her uniform pockets. Hi, Miss Naper, Ruth Rose said. Well, hi, Irene said. Say, weren't you at Panda Park this morning? Yeah, we're sorry about the kidnapping, Josh said. Irene's smile disappeared. I'm so angry, I don't know what to do, she said. Who would steal a baby panda? No one knew what to say. Good thing Winnie's old enough to eat bamboo, Irene said. If she still needed her mother's milk, I don't think she'd make it. Ruth Rose nudged Dink. Um... We're writing a story for the panda paper, Dink said. Could we ask you some questions? The woman looked at Dink for a moment. Yeah, I guess, she said finally. Just then, Pal barked at the ducks, and they scattered. But first, let's move your dog away from my ducks, Irene said. The kids followed Irene to a shady bench. She sat and stretched out her long legs. Shoot, Irene said. Pal sighed and dropped to the ground. Irene started stroking his ears. Dink noticed that Irene's hair, hands were large and strong looking. There's Irene, so she is in charge of the pandas in the panda enclosure. 
I wonder if you guys think she's shady. Everyone was waiting for Dink to ask a question, but Dink's mind was suddenly blank. Who takes care of Ping and Winnie? Ruth Rose asked, coming to Dink's rescue. I do, Irene said. I feed them, clean out their area, all that stuff. Ping even lets me hold her baby. Dink wrote down what Irene said. Then he asked, when did you last see Winnie? Last night, Irene said, when I added fresh water to their pool. That was about eight o'clock. So someone snatched her between then and 10 o'clock this morning, Ruth Rose said. Irene nodded. Dink thought she might cry. Dink had his next question already. How many people have keys to the gate, he asked. Irene looked at him. Only me, she said finally. She patted a key ring hanging from her belt. And trust me, this was never out of my sight. Whoever took Winnie didn't unlock that gate. A duck waddled over and pecked at Irene's boot. She reached into her pocket and found a few more pellets and flung them to the ground. I've got to get back to work, she said, standing up. She glanced down at Dink's notebook. Good luck with your story. Thanks, Dink said. By the way, do you know where Tom Steele lives? Irene shook her head. No, but you'll probably find him in his office. Dink looked blank. His office? It's in the senior community center, Irene said. She gave him a suspicious look. I'm surprised you don't know that, since you're writing a story for him. That's the end of the chapter. So his, their cover for asking a bunch of questions is that they're um, writing a story. So now they've interviewed the first suspect. So I wonder what you think of Irene Naper, if you think she's guilty of anything. Hmm. Let's read maybe one more chapter in this video. Chapter five. Dink had to think fast. Tom Steele doesn't know we're doing a story, he said. We just decided to write a little while ago. We're hoping he'll publish it. Does he work on Sundays? Ruth Rose asked. I wouldn't be surprised, Irene said, especially after, after what happened to Winnie. The kids thanked Irene and headed out of the petting zoo. Pal trotted behind Josh with his long ears nearly touching the ground. Think she's the kidnapper? Dink asked. I do, said Josh. Did you see the size of her hands? She could kidnap a crocodile. It could be her, Ruth Rose said. She's the only one with a key. I don't know, Dink said. She really seems to like animals. Maybe she likes money better, Josh said, wiggling his eyebrows. They entered the senior community center through the rear door. Dink spotted a sign that said the panda paper and an arrow pointing down a hallway. Um, what do we ask this guy? Josh whispered. Pal sniffed the floor as they walked. For one thing, Dink said, I'll ask him if he'll put my story in his paper. The one you haven't even written yet? Josh asked with a grin. Yeah, that one, said Dink. Soft guitar music greeted them at the open door. Tom Steele was sitting at a computer with his back to the kids. A small radio sat on the desk. Dink knocked on the door jam. The editor went on typing. He was humming along with the tune. Come on, Ruth Rose said. She walked into the room. Tom Steele whirled around in his chair. You scared me, he said. He stood up and stared at the kids. He was probably only a little taller than Dink, but his spiky hair and cowboy boots added another three inches. He wore round glasses under thick eyebrows that met in the middle. One of his hands had a band-aid across his palm. Sorry, Dink said. I'm Dink Duncan, and um, I'm writing a story about Winnie. This morning you said you wanted stories, so I... Tom raised one hairy eyebrow at Dink. You're a writer? Not yet, but I want to be when I grow up, Dink said. Tom glanced down at Pal. Who's this? His name is Pal, Josh said. He used to belong to Crooks. Huh, Tom said, sitting back down. He removed his glasses, leaned back, and plunked his boots on top of his desk. The desk was littered with papers, scissors, a bottle of glue, pencils, and an oily pizza box. Tom held up an issue of the panda paper. There were holes cut in the paper where the sections had been. Have you been reading any of these? He asked. We read them all, Ruth Rose said. She showed Tom her own copy. We like pandas, Josh said. Tom squinted his eyes. He stared at the tip of his boots. The only noise in the room was the ticking of the clock. I like pandas too, he said finally. If I get my hands on whoever kidnapped Winnie, he rubbed his face. Okay, write your story. If it's good, I'll print it. Could we ask you a few more questions? Dink pulled his notebook from his pocket. Tom sighed and glanced at his watch. I guess I can spare a few more minutes, he said. And here's a very interesting picture. I hope you can see the things that are all over the desk. Looks like there's a paper with holes cut out of it. That's interesting. And look in the back of his office. You see right there, leaning against the wall. I don't know if you can tell, but that's a fishing pole. And they were thinking that whoever the crook was, was a fisherman. Hmm. Do you know anyone who has a key to the panda enclosure? Dink asked. Yeah, Irene Naper does, he said. I think she's the only one. Dick nodded. Have you ever noticed anyone weird hanging around Panda Park? Josh asked. Tom shook his head slowly. Just normal looking people like you and me, he said, grinning. 
Were you surprised when Ping got upset this morning? Ruth Rose asked. Sure, we all were, Tom said. Flip told me he'd never seen her so angry. Does Flip Francis visit the pandas a lot? Josh asked. Tom stood up. I have no idea, he said, and I have to get back to work. He stuck out his left hand to shake. Excuse the wrong one. I got a bad paper cut on the other one. Thanks, Mr. Steele, Dink said, shaking his hand. He hesitated, then asked, Do you know where we can find Flip Francis? Flip works at the fitness center, Tom said, pointing toward Main Street. Ruth Rose took a close look at the top of Tom's desk. Are you going to write a story about the kidnapping, Mr. Steele? She asked. The man nodded toward the mess on his desk. That's what I'm doing right now, he said. So if you'll excuse me. Dink promised to bring his story by in a couple of days, and the kids left. They hurried back down the hall, out the back door, and into the sunshine. He's the one, Josh announced. That band-aid gave it away. Paper cut my Aunt Fanny. I bet Winnie bit his hand when he grabbed her. He had scissors and glue on his desk, and he was cutting out newspaper clippings, Ruth Rose said. The ransom note and letters had letters cut out of newspapers. And did you guys see what was leaning in the corner? Josh asked. No, but you're going to tell us, right? Dink said. A fishing pole, Josh said. And that was a fishing knife pal found in the bamboo. I say we call the cops. I don't know, Dink said. This guy has a hurt hand, and he'd need both hands if he was climbing a fence carrying a panda. Josh smirked. Ever heard of a ladder? Dink grinned at his friends. What, the guy carries a ladder, an alarm clock, a knife, and a panda? Maybe we should be looking for a juggler. And that's the end of that chapter. So we've seen two interviews so far with Irene Naper and now with Tom Steele. So I wonder how many of you think it's Irene Naper and how many of you think it's Tom Steele. I wish I could see you voting right now. I wonder what you think. But I think we'll stop for there. We've read about half, so maybe I can finish it in one other video. I hope you enjoyed the first half of the Panda Puzzle. I'll see you soon. Bye!